This morning we're going to be talking about a message called the rattling. You know, this scripture we'll be reading in a moment, and that we'll be talking about for a few moments, is really for Israel and the great gathering that happened in the natural and starting in May of 1948, going on into the day of the Lord, which starts with the opening of the tribulation and the 144,000 that are gathered and ultimately ascends into the millennium kingdom that we talked about last week. This morning, however, as we look at Ezekiel 37, first 10 verses, I'd like to say I believe this is also for the church. This also happened when Christ walked out of the grave, walked out of the tomb, and started the beginning of this dispensation, which really exploded at Pentecost Day, with the cloven tongues of fire and the mighty wind, and proceeded for the next two millennium, 2,000 years, the longest of all the dispensations we've enjoyed. And then we'll go into that great rapture gathering that's very close. And certainly, the wedding feast of the bride in heaven that I pray you are going to be part of. Ezekiel 37, stand with me as we look at this magnificent scripture. Ezekiel 37, I'd like to read the first 10 verses. This is absolutely one of the most spectacular of all visions in the Bible. So real that it's debatable whether it was a vision or actually happened in front of Ezekiel. I feel it actually happened, and he was seeing it on through the ages. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, and by the way, this is an extremely good answer. <laughs> he said, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. He didn't go either into presumption or doubt. He didn't go either direction. O oh Lord God, thou knowest. And again he said to me, prophesy over these bones. And say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life, and I will put sinews on you, and make flesh grow back on you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive. And you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 7. So I prophesied as was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. 
So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them and they came to life and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. You may be seated under God's word. So let's do it again. Let's do it again. Ezekiel, this great, great prophet of God, the word of God came to him and told him to go out to a horrible and awful valley. Now, I understand I'm at living and I'm telling the story. I understand I gave the scripture first. That's the standard. Now we're going to give the story as well. And he saw this hideous valley where all these dead lay and there was nothing but bone left and they were very dry and then came an impossible message from God. And the message was for Ezekiel to prophesy over these bones. Now promise came with that and the promise was that as he prophesied these bones would begin to come together and sinew would begin to come on and then flesh and then skin. And so Ezekiel obeyed the voice of the Lord. But it wasn't enough. Because as he prophesied, though all those things began to happen, the dead still lay as bodies. And then the word of God came for him to prophesy to the very breath, to the four winds. And he prophesied again, and the breath of God came on them. And they stood up a massive and glorious army. Now let's talk about it. It says they were very dry. We live in a moment, and I'm relating this whole thing to the church today, although I've already said this passage was primarily for Israel. I said that, right? If you keep reading in the chapter, it talks about the regathering of Judah and Israel. But it certainly applies to us because all Scripture is profitable for teaching and training in righteousness. So, it is profitable for the church. It's important for us as the church to get all of the Word of God. Very dry. One of the fastest growing churches in this great city has a billboard that says, No perfect people allowed. Now, can I just tell you that is horrible theology? Because Scripture says, Be thou perfect even as I am perfect. So there's a call to righteousness on you and on me. And according to that billboard, the Christ certainly couldn't go through those doors because he was perfect. And anyone that wants to walk in righteousness and holiness certainly wouldn't be welcome there. Saw him come on television, the pastor of this church, and he spent an hour on TV explaining how repentance was not needed. Very dry. Because the scripture is plain, there's a difference between justification and sanctification. Justification absolutely happens at Calvary. You are totally forgiven and heaven bound. But the sanctification is a lifelong work that you need to be always after, which includes walking clean. So if the Holy Spirit brings to your mind an error or someone you've hurt or someone that you have offended, you have to ask for forgiveness. No? Yes. You have to ask for forgiveness and go to the person get right. It's a walk of sanctification, right? It's a whole walk. Forgive one another. There's so much in the Word of God that talks about our outworking. 
Walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. It says not only that they were dry, they were very dry in verse 2. This word dry, yabash in the Hebrew, spelled Y-A-B-E-S-H, yabash. It means to be ashamed. It means to be confused. It means to be disappointed. It means to dry up like water. It means to wither like plants. It means to be confounded. Six definitions of yabash. First is ashamed. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? The Apostle Paul took his stand and said these magnificent words. Say it with me if you know the words. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you've heard it. Now you know it. So let's say it together. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is repentance. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is atonement through the blood of of Christ Jesus and its forgiveness. But now across the body of Christ, now across the church, the thinking is strongly, this is true, the thinking is strongly that the gospel's too harsh. It's not quite relevant. A little too exclusive. And so everyone's trying to help out the good news, help out the gospel, and make it a little more relevant, and make it a little more less exclusive, and make it not so harsh. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm talking about the Word of God, the the Scripture, the way that it's presented in the Bible, not the way that some guy thinks it ought to be done, right? To not be ashamed... They're very dry. This word dry, secondly, means confused as to roll. Did you know that we are meant to be the head and not the tail? Who wants to be the tail anyway? But, but we're, we're called to be the head, not the, not the tail. I can prove this in Scripture. It's all through the Word. Psalm 18, verse 43 says, Thou hast placed me As head of the nations. Head, right? That means front, top, the leader, okay? Deuteronomy 28 was very clear in two verses in that chapter. The Lord will make you, who? You, right? The head and not the tail. And you only will be above. And you will not be underneath. This is pretty plain, right? If you listen to the commandments, Lord your God, which I charge you today, to observe them carefully. And then he goes on. This is, of course, Moses, the great prophet and lawgiver. He shall be the head and you will not be the tail. In other words, God means us to always be the one that's the lender, not the one that's begging and borrowing. This has many ramifications (laughs) for dominion and many ramifications for the work that we do all the time, that we're meant to not be in debt. Scripture talks against it. But the pulpits, and I try to believe me, I, I'm not ragging on my pastor friends. I, I've spoken and been with thousands and thousands of them across the world. They're my brothers. I'm very burdened for them, but I'm also burdened that they carry the right message to God's people. It needs to be clear. It needs to be correct. But we have in our pulpits jugglers that are actually juggling, doing the juggling acts. I watched this on a video, and this is a large growing church, doing juggling acts as they postulate false doctrine. Another pastor does cannonballs whenever there's a baptism service. He goes and does a cannonball in the water. Pretty cool, huh? Not so. Another pastor had was up in a tree stand on the pulpit. They made a tree stand for all the hunters. And so they had him behind bushes. He did the whole 
sermon behind these bushes and this tree stand on the... <laughs> this is true. If you're looking out like this can't be true. You think that's something. This one pastor was doing this baptism service in a huge church. I'm talking about a church of thousands. And he decided to one of the people to hold him down. So while he was baptizing, he wouldn't let him come up out of the water. The guy comes blasting out of the water, gasping for air, and half the room is hilariously laughing. And I hope you're the half that was very grieved by what was going on here, the desecration of baptism and the desecration of something that's meant to be good and right and uplifting. Disappointed. First one was ashamed. Second, confused. Third, disappointed in the biblical outworking. Disappointed in brotherhood. Disappointed in the church. Disappointed in family. You ever had a disappointment? Oh, yeah. I had a pastor, though, call me from Georgia a couple weeks ago. And he was almost as disturbed as I am about the condition of the church and his fellow pastors in this large city in Georgia, large city in Georgia. And he was saying, Brother Paul, what is going on? There is so much false teaching and delusion of the Word of God. And he said, the church is so lost and confused, she's nowhere to go but up. I'm thinking that's a quote. <laughs> nowhere to go but up. Nowhere to the rapture. Nowhere to go but, but up. But I mean, and I tried to encourage him and told him to hang in there and we needed to be a light for our generation, not just the two of us, but all the ministers of the gospel. Fourth, dry up. Again, these are all meanings of dry. To dry up, no water, no life, no freshness. I would ask, where? is the anointing of God. If you're singing and praising God on Sunday, I pray that the anointing of God is with you, not that it's devoid of the Spirit. If you're hearing the Word of God, I pray you're sensing the anointing of the Lord on His Word. But I would say, where is the anointing of God? Do you know during the Millennium Kingdom the anointing will be all across the world? Fifth is wither, not growing. So here comes question. You ready for the question? Are you the same that you were a year ago? I, I see a lot of heads going this way. That's good. <laughs> In other words... God's worked some things in you. Death in your family or loss of a job or pain, maybe joy. But whatever God has worked in you, that it's taken you onward. Don't waste your sorrows. Say it with me. Don't waste your sorrows. <laughs> you want to grow. You don't want to be the same one year from now, right? When you're 18, right? Right? Right. You don't want to be the same. You, you want it to have grown in the Lord when you're now 40 rather than 39 or whatever the, the number is. But you want to keep growing in God. You don't want to stay stagnant. Number six, confounded. The church so often doesn't have direction and wisdom and wisdom and wisdom and understanding and wisdom and understanding. Did I mention which wisdom? But church needs it. I call it circular Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Around the same mulberry bush, right? You're saved, wait to get baptized, then you're saved and wait for the next person to get baptized. You just keep on the same circular thing, hearing the same message again and again and again, again and again and again, and never grow. Circular Christianity. Of course, I would quickly throw in empty Judaism. I mentioned this on the front end. But Judaism is devoid and empty 
And my grandfather was Jewish. I understand some of this. I've got thousands of Jewish friends on Facebook, including hundreds of rabbis. But I would say clearly, Judaism is empty without its Messiah, Jesus the Christ. It's just a form. So here comes the first prophecy. We've talked about the meanings of being dry. The first prophecy comes, verse 4, and on into 7, in Ezekiel 37. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. Now this word prophesy literally means to speak over, to speak above, to speak into. The word of God going into the bones, going into the dryness. O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Imagine speaking to bones. This is what Ezekiel was doing. Whole valley of them. Huge valley, obviously, by the ramifications at the end of the section. And it says there was a noise. <laughs> Behold, a rattling. Let's look at this word noise first. Kol in the Hebrew, spelled Q-O-L. And it means to call aloud, it means a voice, it means a sound, it means a crackling, it means to sing. It means to a spark, it means thunder. So first of all, call aloud this word noise, coal, to call aloud. God hasn't called just to spiritually sleep. He's called you to call forth his word by your life by how you live. He means to have a voice. God always has a voice. He always uses his remnant. He always has a people. He always has women, men, that are willing to speak and be his voice. Are you? I pray you are. The sound this is the sound of the Spirit. An unusual sound like nothing else. Crackling, that implies the burning of God, the crackling of the fire. Fifth, sing, worship, when you sing. The noise we're meant to make, it means that worship that comes out of our singing. Spark, starting things. Seven, thunder. Do you hear it? Do you hear the thunder of God? I mean, he is certainly thundering from his throne. He certainly means to shake nations. And soon, 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 he's going to be doing this again. The noise through our testimony. The noise through our purity of life. The noise through the love of the brethren the immediate expectation of the return of Christ. Is the Lord coming back? When? Soon! <laughs> Whatever that means. You know, that might be a thousand years, but more likely it's just about a thousand moments. But I mean, soon! Let's look at this word rattling. We've talked about noise. Rattling. The rash. Rash of God. Our A-A-S-H, the Ra'ash. It means uproar, commotion, earthquake. <clears throat> wow. Fierceness, shaking, rattling, rushing, shaking again. God bringing true spiritual uproar. Have you ever thought of the earthquakes in the Bible? I mean, I could probably, I'd like to do this sometime, do a whole study on all the earthquakes in the Bible. They're, they happen 
at fabulous and crucial moments, the earthquakes come. And they're not stopped, by the way. There's going to be earthquakes coming during the tribulation, earthquakes after the resurrection of the two witnesses. I mean, there's a bunch of earthquakes throughout the Word of God, and they're still coming, more of them. But I believe God gives hints. H-I-N-T-S, hints. I think he gives little hints, or sometimes they're big hints, of what he's going to do. We were in Petrolia, South Africa. This huge auditorium, massive auditorium. And I was a closing speaker, and the place was packed with pastors. All black pastors, by the way. Precious men of God. Precious. And they really did honor me as a white guy <laughs> to let me be the closing speaker at this huge conference. And I remember closing it with, we are the men of God. We are the people of God. And something happened in that room. It was electric. And it was a hint. And this whole section of drummers over here began to boom, 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 boom. All these drums beginning to beat. And then this group of about four or five of these black pastors began to stand up and begin to move. And then Sandra Freed stood, this blonde, in the middle of these five black pastors, and she began to move with them. You don't have any idea who's sitting here. I almost made you stand as I did this section. But she's been of 50 nations, and she's done this kind of thing in so many places. But this was a moment of a hint, because as the six of them began to move and rejoice and dance before God, before you knew it, hundreds of these black pastors were circling around them and began to do it as well. And finally, the entire stadium, the entire area was packed with these thousand black pastors with this one blonde in the middle representing, I think, the church. Listen to me before you laugh. Representing the church of Jesus Christ. I'm convinced of it. And these men were responding, I believe, to the Spirit of God. And this went on for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour. I'm telling you, I saw it. I was on the platform. And I was done speaking. And so I just watched this for an hour and a half. As this one woman and a thousand Black pastors rejoiced in God and would not be stopped in their worship. A hint, a hint of what's coming. I was in Manila, Philippines, and there were two speakers at this conference, 400 pastors in Manila. And the first minister stood up under the guise of a testimony, began to brag about what he was like before he had ever come to Christ. And in front of all these pastors, explicitly rolled out his sexual adventures with woman after woman after woman until I was ready to throw up. It was everything I could do to remain in my seat until my turn because I was going to close it. Finally, I stood up and without mentioning him, I just talked about the Word of God and talked about the power of the Spirit and went into these men's hearts, these 400 pastors that had come all across the Philippines. And then the two of us when I was done, we stepped down into the middle and went like this, and we went on opposite sides of the room. And I watched as 400 pastors ran by this guy and mobbed me. 
Now they weren't mobbing Paul because he was Paul. They were mobbing me because of the word of God that they were hungry for. And I'm thinking, a hint, a hint, a hint. That the nations would be hungry for the word of God. And the word of God would go forth clearly and powerfully and succinctly. Too long have we been lying in the dust. Too long have we been content with mediocrity. Too long have we been lulled into religion, to blessing theology, where it's all about us. Or seeker-sensitive heresy, where it's all about them and bringing them in at any cost into the fold as though the fold mattered not and no doors and no standard and no righteousness and let's all just be as we are and not worry about there being a God that cares particularly about how we act. Too long as the church been effeminated. We stand today in a pulpit, it's important that it represent all of God. Christ was a man, you're aware of this, right? Ho, ho, ho. And the gender of God is masculine. Doesn't mean he doesn't love the ladies, doesn't mean he doesn't have a ministry for the ladies, doesn't mean he doesn't die, he didn't die for the ladies, of course he did. But we need to understand on the ground that we walk, there will soon be a time for a great rahash, great rattling. Rahash, say it with me. Rahash, it's your Hebrew word for the day. <laughs> rahash, one more time. Rahash. It means uproar, it means commotion, it means earthquake, it means fierceness, it means quaking, it means rattling, it means rushing, it means shaking. Uproar. You causing an uproar at your school? It means commotion. You know, the movement of God isn't always really nice and pretty the way you would box it in, right? Sometimes it comes with commotion. It does. Earthquake. We've already talked about it, but if your heart is not quaking, you're listening to this, right? If your heart is not quaking underneath the Word of God, I would call you again to hear the Word of God, to open your heart to it. Fierceness. Boy, you see, that's an awful strong word. Fierceness? Is the Word of God fierce? Oh, can't be the lion of the tribe of Judah and not have some fierceness going on. Quaking, rattling, we're talking about rattling. Rushing, like a mighty wind. Shaking. And then it says the bones came together bone to bone. People joined together. That's you, me, I hope, in commitment. You committed? Joined together in commitment. In loyalty. What are you loyal to? In loyalty. In faithfulness. Joined together bone to bone in a common battle. You know, we've got a common enemy. You know this, right? We do. And I'm happy to say we have a common Lord for those of us that know Christ. All oh, the power of the gospel. The power of the word of God. The Bible talks about the great kinsman redeemer. That's our Christ. It also talks about a kindred people. It says sinews were on them and flesh grew and skin covered them. That's true organic Christianity. True organic belief, faith. It's the real deal. So now comes the second prophecy, and I'm going to start winding this down in a moment, but it says in verse 9, And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Now remember, all these bones, all this sinew, all this skin, it all come together, but they're all lying there dead. They're just bodies. They're just nothing without the breath. Verse 10 says, breath came into them. Ruach, ruach. 
is the Hebrew, spelled R-U-A-C-H, rock. And it means breath, it means life, it means air. My son and I were talking about this morning, this. Our son David speaks Hebrew, and he was telling me all the meanings of this Hebrew word, and I went, whoa, that is packed word. <laughs> breath, life, air, blast, courage, wind. Breath. We see worship exchanged for concerts. It's basically what it amounts to. Concerts, where you're the spectator out there, and the concert's going up on the platform, right? That's not the way it's meant to be. Light shows, fake Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter how many sparklers and how much smoke machines you got running, if the Holy Spirit's not there, it means nothing. It's not enough to just be together. Mobs are together. Sports events are together. Right? It's not enough just to be together. You've got to be alive spiritually. <laughs> Actually need the rosh of the Holy Spirit. Adam needed it. God formed him, right? Of the dust, of the ground, stood him up, but he still needed the rosh, still needed the spirit. Valley of dry bones needs the rosh, needs this breath, needs the spirit. You need it, I need it. Presence, the presence, the presence of God. And they came to life, it says, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. They came to life. In other words, they weren't dead, they weren't lukewarm, they weren't cool, they weren't sullen. They came to life and they stood on their feet. The dignity of manhood, power, and the dignity of womanhood, glory. Again, the hint, we were in the Ukraine. My wife and I, we've been so many places around the world. We were in the Ukraine. We spoke the gospel to a group of people that had never heard it before. And all of a sudden, Right in the middle of my message, this guy jumps up and he says, I want it now! I want this now! <laughs> he wasn't waiting for any altar call. <laughs> I want this now! <laughs> and he meant it. He said, this is my family. He interrupted the whole service. I loved it. He, he said, this is my whole family. We all need this right now. And he did this in, in Ukrainian, but it was getting translated. He was doing it. The guy beside him was telling me what he was saying. It was incredible. I was loving it. And so we led him to the Lord right there in the middle of the service. Ben! Then later on I could finish the message. I didn't need to finish the message. He needed to come to Christ. I want it now. Say it with me. I want it now. The hence. An exceedingly great army, it says in verse 10. Exceedingly means vehement, speedily, far, fast, good, louder and louder, utterly. Vehemence. If these are the people of God, Speedily, that means discipline. Far. Vision. I see you. I see what God is doing. Fast. Not sluggish. Good. He that doeth good is of God. It says in 3 John 11th verse. Louder and louder. Not making noise for noise's sake, but louder and louder with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and not silent before evil, utterly, complete men and women, utterly sold out to the Lord Jesus. A great army, not a mob, not a rock concert, not for entertainment, but unique, set apart, dangerous and good. Say it with me. Dangerous and good. We are. So I conclude this message with these simple statements. Listen. Do you hear the rattling? Feel that pulling of God towards his purposes, bone to bone. Ah, oh, the breath of God. 
like nothing else you'll ever experience. Breathe on me, breath of God. Look! An exceedingly great army. God bless you.